At this point, I think that we understand some of the core components of the world of Kubernetes. We understand what pods are, what deployments are, and how we can expose pods to the outside world through the use of basic services like the cluster IP service. In this section, we're going to start taking our previous application, so that multi-container app that was calculating Fibonacci values, and we're going to bring it into the world of Kubernetes. We've kind of already been going down that path with this simple K8s folder, right? We've been setting up our multi-client image a little bit and working around with it, but we're now going to start putting a concerted effort together to take that previous multi-container application we had put together and adopt it into a sort of Kubernetes architecture. Now I've got a diagram that's going to be a high-level overview of the general architecture that we're going to use. So everything you see here is in a single node. We're going to first develop all this stuff locally. We're going to set up the entire application on our local Kubernetes cluster. After we get this all put together locally, we're then going to deploy it off to a service provider such as AWS or Google Cloud. When we deploy it out there, we will have the option to expand to multiple nodes. So we won't necessarily just be limited to one single virtual machine for all these different objects that we're going to create. But for right now, we're just going to kind of imagine that it's all sitting on one single node. Now this diagram is showing the general overall architecture that we're going to use for us moving our multi-container app into the world of Kubernetes. You'll notice that there are some very familiar pieces in here. So we've got the multi-client set of pods all being managed by a deployment. We've got the multi-server. Remember, that's the Express API being managed by a deployment. And then you'll notice that I've also added in Redis as a pod this time around and Postgres as a pod this time around as well. So back on the multi-container deployment on Amazon Web Services, when we used Elastic Beanstalk, we delegated to these outside services provided by AWS to manage our Redis and Postgres needs. But now that we're moving over to Kubernetes, we're going to put, things, put these things together in a production environment ourselves, rather than relying upon some outside service to do it for us. The overall purpose of the app is going to stay the same. So it's still going to be all about calculating some Fibonacci values. I know it's kind of a silly example, but it works and it allows us to have a couple of different services that work together in a nice fashion. Now you will notice that inside this diagram, there are a couple of new terms as well. So for example, on the far left-hand side is something called an ingress service. You'll notice that rather than having the node ports on our deployment for multi-client that we had previously, we now have a cluster IP. And it looks like just about every deployment that we put together, with the exception of the multi-worker right here, has a cluster IP kind of somewhat attached to it. So of course, we're going to talk about what an ingress is and what a cluster IP is as well. The other new piece of terminology that you'll notice inside of here is something called a Postgres PVC. PVC stands for Persistent Volume Claim. And of course, we'll talk about what that means when we get to setting up our Postgres stuff as well. All right, so that's the idea. We're going to take our previous application and we're going to move it into the world of Kubernetes. Now here's the general step series of steps that we're going to take. So in a development environment, we're going to first create a config file for every last thing that you just saw in that diagram. So we're going to have configuration files for the ingress service for this cluster IP, for this cluster IP, for this one, for this one. And we're going to have config files for every single one of these deployments as well. And we'll also have a config file for this persistent volume claim down here, thing down here too. So in total, we're talking about like 10 or 12 or something like that different config files. It is going to be a lot of typing, but we definitely are going to learn a lot about these configuration files along the way. Now, once we put together all these config files, we're then going to test everything out locally on Minikube. So we're going to make sure that everything works locally first, and we're going to use it as our development environment. We're going to be as, you know, kind of as confident as we possibly can that when we eventually push this up to a production environment, everything will work the way we expect. After that, we're going to build a GitHub and Travis deployment flow, very similar to the one we had done previously for both the single container and multi-container applications. But of course, there will be some edits to it to make sure that everything is set up for a Kubernetes deployment, as opposed to the rather easy and straightforward Elastic Beanstalk we were doing before. And then of course, the very last step is to make sure that we can actually deploy this entire thing to a cloud provider like AWS or Google Cloud. And yes, we're gonna go through that entire series of steps together and make sure that people can actually visit our application in a meaningful way. All right, so we definitely have our work cut out for us, no two ways about it. 
So when we come back together in the next section, we're going to flip back over to our complex multi-container project, and we're going to start setting up config files for everything inside of here. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how we're going to take our multi-container project and update it to use Kubernetes as opposed to the Docker Compose or Elastic Beanstalk setup that it currently has. Now you will notice that in the last lecture, I posted the zip file for the complex project. I put it there just in case you made any changes to the project. That is a backup of my exact files as they stand right now. So I took my exact complex folder directory with the server, the client, the worker, the whole nine yards, and I put it into that zip file. So again, if you made any changes to the project whatsoever between the last video that we were working on it and right now, I highly encourage you to download that zip file and use that as the starting point for all this Kubernetes stuff. Now in this section, we're going to take the complex project or the multi-container project, and we're going to start it up with Docker Compose. The reason that we're going to do this is to just make sure that everything is still working the way we expect. Because if we start building out all this Kubernetes stuff, but some of the underlying project code got changed by you at some point in time, or it's in a broken state, doing the Kubernetes stuff is going to be basically impossible, completely impossible. So we just need to make sure that the code that you're using and the code that I'm using is still working and 100% up to date. All right, so you'll notice that I'm inside of my complex project folder right here. The other thing that I want you to triple, triple check, make sure that you are not using a copy of Docker that has been configured to run inside of our, or to access the Docker server inside of your node. So you can very easily do that by doing a Docker PS. And you should see that you have very few or absolutely no containers running whatsoever. If you see a ton of printout, that means that your Docker client is still configured to access the Docker server inside the node. We do not want to start up Docker Compose inside of the node whatsoever. If you ha are still using the updated copy of Docker or the reconfigured version, remember all you have to do to get back to the non-configured version is open up a new terminal window. That's pretty much it. Just open a new terminal window and do a Docker PS again, and you'll be back to using your local copy of Docker server. Okay, so again, I'm inside of my multi-container project directory. I see the docker compose.yaml file right here. I'm going to run docker compose up and rebuild all these images. And again, we're just doing this to make sure that all of the existing code works as we expect. So I'm going to do a docker compose up dash dash build because I want to explicitly rebuild everything. And I'm going to let that run. It's going to take a couple minutes to rebuild everything and launch it all. Now you'll notice in my case, I kind of just very recently rebuilt all this stuff. So it launches very quickly. I do want to remind you that the very first time you launch all these containers, if you cleared out all the cached version of the containers and whatnot, it might crash a little bit the very first time you launch it. So I do encourage you to stop Docker Compose immediately after it starts up and do a Docker Compose up a second time. And the second time you don't need to add on the dash dash build flag. All right, so I'm gonna launch that. I'm gonna wait just a second for the development server to start up. And then you'll recall that we can access all this stuff on localhost port 3050. I already opened up my code editor inside that complex directory. Here's the Docker Compose file. Here's the Nginx server that we are using for routing inside of our application. And you'll recall that we had set up localhost 3050 as being the central point to access everything inside of here. So I'm just gonna very quickly test this out by opening up my browser and going to localhost 3050. And again, I should still see all of my numbers here, any previous values that I had entered, unless you had, of course, deleted or completely stopped and deleted the Redis and the Postgres containers. And just to make sure that everything's working the way I expect, I'm gonna enter in a new index here of 12. I'm gonna submit it. I'll then refresh and I'll see 12 added here and I'll see a calculated value for 12 down there as well. Okay, so hopefully you see something like this. Again, if you don't see everything updated and still working like so, then I really encourage you to go back to the previous lecture, download that zip file, and use that as the starting point for all this Kubernetes stuff, just to make sure that you and I are on 100% equal footing. Okay, so let's take a pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we'll get started with taking all of our existing images and migrating them into the world of Kubernetes. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we tested out our multi-container application with Docker Compose, just to make sure that everything was still working the way we expect. I'm now going to close down Docker Compose, 
and return back to the command line. Now from this section on, we're going to start to make changes to our project inside of the complex directory. So if you want to keep a record of all the stuff that we had done for Elastic Beanstalk and for Docker Compose and whatnot, feel free to make a backup of this folder right now. I in particular already made a copy of this folder. I made a copy and called it Complex Elastic Beanstalk just to serve as a backup of sorts. Now of course I can rely upon Git as a backup as well, to, just to make it easy for you to refer to all of my code at some point in the future, I made the easy backup folder right here. All right, so I'm going to go back into the complex directory, and then I'm going to start up my code editor inside this folder. Now we're going to first begin by cleaning up our project directory a little bit. We're going to delete some of the different files and folders that are not going to be required for this new Kubernetes version of this application. So the first thing I'm going to do is find the Travis.yaml file, the Docker Compose, and the Docker Run files. And I'm going to delete all three of those. We do not need these files anymore because we're going to rely upon Kubernetes to run our application both in a development and production environment. And for the Travis.yaml file, we're going to essentially recreate that thing from scratch when we eventually try to take this application to Travis again. Now I'm also going to delete the Nginx folder we previously had a Nginx image to serve as kind of the primary routing inside of our entire cluster of containers. But now for routing, we're going to rely upon something called the ingress service, which we're going to talk about at great length in a little bit. But for right now, just know that we don't need this Nginx image anymore. So I'm going to delete that thing as well. All right, so now I have just client, server, and worker, and nothing else. Now the first thing I'm going to do is create a new folder inside of here called K8s, like so. And we're going to use this folder to house all of the different configuration files that we're going to create for our project. In total, we're going to have one separate configuration file for each of these different objects that you see on the screen. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Eleven configuration files. Yeah, that's a lot, but hey, we'll get through it. So let's first begin by putting together a configuration file to create our multi-client deployment. We've already put together a configuration file for this on the project we were just working on a second ago as we were first learning Kubernetes, but we're just gonna recreate the thing from scratch right now just to get some of the common typing that we have to do inside of our head. All right, so inside of my K8s folder, I'm going to make a new file called client-deployment.yaml. And then inside of here, we'll put together all the configuration required to create this deployment with three child pods running the multi-client image. So at the very top, we'll start off by designating the API version that we want to use, which is going to be apps v1. We'll specify the kind of object that we're going to create inside of this file. It's going to be a deployment. And then we'll add on some metadata, in this case, just the name of the deployment. And it's going to be our client deployment. Next up, we'll add a spec that's going to configure this deployment. So we're going to say that we want three replicas of the multi-client image, or really the multi-client pod running. And we want those three replicas to be managed by this deployment. After that, we'll put down our selector. I'll say match labels. And then I'm going to use the same key value pair as a label that we had used previously, which is to say component web. In other words, this means that the component of our application that this deployment is going to be managing is the web or front end side of things. After that, we'll specify the pod template. Now remember, the template right here is going to be on the same indentation layer as the selector above it. So for the template, I'll provide some metadata that will provide a label of component web. Remember the selector out here and the label inside the template is how the deployment is going to identify the different pods that it's supposed to manage. Next up, we're going to add a spec. And again, this is going to be on the same indentation level as metadata. And then we'll specify all the different containers that are going to run inside this pod. In this case, we have just one container. It's gonna have a name of client. The image we wanted to use will be your Docker ID multi-client, and then finally we'll specify a port to open. We'll use a container port of 3000, and that's going to be the port that is mapped up to the multi-client image. All right, 
So that's pretty much it for our client deployment. Let's take a quick pause right now. When we come back in the next section, we're going to very quickly put together a new configuration file for this service right here. And we'll talk a little bit about exactly what a cluster IP is, because previously we had only used a node port. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our multi-client deployment config file. Now we had already written out all the configuration for this before, and it's essentially a clone of what we already had. But again, I just wanted you to get used to some of the pieces of terminology inside of here, because you're going to be writing quite a bit of these configuration files over time. All right, so now that we've got the deployment put together, we're going to start working on the cluster IP service. You will recall that the previous deployment we had worked on used a node port service. So the first thing we're going to do is figure out exactly what a cluster IP is. All right, so first off, I want you to recall that in the world of Kubernetes, we use a service anytime that we want to set up some networking for an object, such as a single pod or a group of pods that are managed by a deployment. Now we made use of a node port, which is going to expose a single pod or a cluster of pods to the outside world. And that's why you were and I were able to type in a IP, or specifically the IP for our Minikube virtual machine, and then a port in the 30,000 range. It was completely the node port that allowed us to access our running pod inside of our browser. Now the cluster IP is a little bit more restrictive form of networking. The cluster IP is going to allow any other object inside of our cluster to access the object that the cluster IP is pointing at but nobody from the outside world, so in other words, people like you and me or anyone inside their web browser can access the object that the service is married up to or pointing to. So what does that mean practically? Well, it means that when we assign a cluster IP to any of these deployments that you see here, anything else running inside of our cluster can access whatever object the cluster IP is pointing at. So in other words, this cluster IP right here is going to provide access for everything else inside of here to the Redis deployment. It's what's going to allow the multi-worker pod to eventually connect to the copy of Redis that it's running here. If we did not have this cluster IP service, then the Redis pod would be completely unreachable and nothing inside of our cluster would be allowed to access that running pod. So that's what the cluster IP is all about. It provides access to an object, most commonly a set of pods, to everything else inside of our cluster. Now, the one thing I want to be really clear about is that a cluster IP is not like a node port in that it does not allow traffic to come in from the outside world. So this right here, this would not be allowed. This does not work. We cannot use a cluster IP to get access to a deployment from outside of our cluster. All right, so that's what a cluster IP is for. In general, we're going to use cluster IPs anytime that we have a service that is, or excuse me, not a service, but an object that is only supposed to be accessed from people already inside of our cluster. Now, the one thing that you will notice is that, of course, we want the multi-client and the multi-server to be accessible from our users, but the way that is going to happen is through the ingress service. Traffic is going to come into this ingress, and then once traffic has come in, it is then effectively inside of our cluster. And so from that point on, our cluster IPs will be accessible only through the ingress service. We'll talk more about the ingress service later on because obviously that's a totally different uh, piece of networking that we have to put together. Okay, so that's pretty much it on cluster IP. Well, let's take a quick pause right now. When we come back in the next section, we'll put together our config file to create a cluster IP for our multi-client deployment. In the last section, we spoke about the purpose of a cluster IP service. So we're now going to flip over to our code editor and create a new config file that's going to expose access to our set of multi-client pods to every other object inside of our cluster. So over inside of my code editor, I'm gonna find my k8s directory and I'm going to make a new file called client cluster IP service.yaml. Then inside of here, we'll put together a little bit of configuration that's gonna look very similar to the config file for the previous service we had created. One was the node port. This one is a cluster IP. At the end of the day, their config files look awfully similar. All right, so inside of here, we'll first start off with an API version of v1. We're going to create an object with a type of service. For our metadata, we're going to provide a name of client cluster IP service 
And then for our spec that's going to configure the way that this service behaves, we're going to specify a type of service of cluster IP. And take note of the capitalization here. We got capital C and capital IP on the end. Next, we need to provide a selector so that the service that we are creating knows what set of pods it is supposed to be providing access to. So in our case, the cluster IP that we are working on right now is going to provide access to our multi-client set of pods. So I need to make sure that we provide a selector, so a selector that's going to properly select our client deployment. If you look inside of our client deployment, you will recall that all of those pods have a label applied to them of component web. So the selector inside of our service will be component web. Finally, we're going to configure the different ports that the cluster IP service are going to expose and be available on. Now the ports rule down here is going to follow the exact same nomenclature as the node port stuff that we had worked on previously. So you remember looking at this diagram, this was the nomenclature that we had for the node port service. So with the node port, we had to provide a port, a target port, and a node port. And each of those different properties had a slightly different purpose. Now in the case of a cluster IP, which is what we're making here, there is no node port property because this cluster IP is not addressable or accessible from the outside world. We are only going to have a port and a target port. The port property is going to be how other pods or other objects inside of our cluster are going to access the pod that we are kind of governing access to. And the target port is going to be the port on the target pod that we are providing access to. So for us, we're going to provide a port of 3000 and a target port of 3000. Now you'll notice that I just left these things here the same. If we wanted to, we could say that you can get access to port 3000 inside that container by trying to access something like, I don't know, 3050 if we wanted to. So now if any outside object wanted to access the multi-client pods, they would have to try to go through port 3050. But honestly, I can't think of any good reason in this particular case that I would want to like do some mismatching of ports here. So I'm just gonna leave them as the same and say that to get at port 3000 inside the container, you're going to get at port 3000 on the service. So if you want to, you can kind of do some redirecting of ports here, but again, I don't really see a good reason to in this particular case. All right, so that's it for our cluster IP service. So let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue with our next deployment in the next section. Rather than moving on to our next config file, I think that it would be kind of nice to take these two config files we just put together and load them up into Kubernetes, just to make sure that everything that we've done so far is on the level and that we don't have any typos or anything like that in there. Now, I do want to remind you that when we load up both these config files through the kubectl apply command, we're not going to be able to very easily test out the multi-client deployment or the client deployment right here just because the service that is governing access to it is not allowing outside traffic. So we will not be able to test this out inside of our browser just yet, but we can at least start up the deployment and look at it in kubectl and say, okay, our pods are actually running. So let's get to it. We're going to load up both these config files right here. Now, the first thing I want to do is to make sure that we delete our old deployment, the previous deployment that we had put together as we were first learning a lot of this stuff. So to delete the old deployment, I'm going to list it out with kubectl git deployments, and then I will delete it with kubectl delete client deployment, or excuse me, delete deployment client deployment. There we go. Again, we list out delete the type of object we want to to delete, and then the name of the thing that we want to delete. So I'll run that. Now I can do a kubectl git deployments, and no resources are found. Now don't forget, we had also created a service as well. It was a node port that was providing access to the set of pods that were created by that deployment. So to get a list of all the services we have created, I'll do kubectl git services. And now we can very easily see that, yes, there is in fact the client node port there. So we can delete this thing in a very similar fashion. I'll do kubectl delete service client node port, like so. Oops, typo there, there we go. So now if I do another get services, 
I'm only going to see the original Kubernetes service. And again, we're not touching that. That's something internal to Kubernetes and we don't need to mess around with it at all. All right, so now we're ready to apply those two config files. Now we could use the same technique that we had previously used for loading up config files, where we did something like kubectl apply dash f. And then remember, we're currently inside the complex folder, but all of our config files are inside of k8s. So we could do something like k8s and then what was the first one called? Client deployment. But there's actually a little shortcut that we can use anytime that we want to apply a group of configuration files. So rather than spelling out the entire path right here, I'm going to instead confirm that the k8 directory is right there. And then I can apply every file inside there with apply f. And I'm just going to provide the k8 directory. When I do this, kubectl is going to look into that folder. It's going to find every config file in there, and it's going to apply all of them at the same time. So if I run that, I'm going to see that we have both IP service created, and in the case of the deployment file, it looks like I probably made a little typo at some point in time. Let's check that out really quickly. See inside there, I said metadata label. Oops, it should be labels, plural, like so. So I'm just gonna make that very quick change. And then if I try applying that thing again, I get both of them created. Well, at least the first one was unchanged, but the second one was created. So now we can do a kubectl get deployments, and we'll see that we have three pods created tied to our client deployment. And of course, if we do a get pods, we'll see all three of those different pods running. Finally, we can do a kubectl get services, and we'll see that we have the cluster IP service created for our client as well. Cool. So we're going to make use of this kubectl apply on a entire directory quite a bit since you and I have like 11 different configuration files at least to manage throughout this application. All right, so let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. In the last couple of sections, we finished up our deployment configuration file and the new cluster IP service to go along with it. We're now going to continue by putting together two more almost identical configuration files, this time all centered around our Express API or the multi-server image. Now we're going to make sure that we do a very similar cluster IP service this time around because we do not want the Express API to be directly accessible from the outside world as would normally be the case with a node port service. Remember, we use the cluster IP anytime that we want to make a set of pods only accessible to other things inside of our node. The ingress service that we're going to eventually put together qualifies as another thing inside of our node. All right, so one quick thing I want to remind you about here is that our multi-server image is always going to be listening for incoming requests on port 5000. And that was something that we had really hard coded into the image itself and the actual server that's running inside there. So when we create our cluster IP service, we're going to make sure that it's going to forward traffic onto port 5000 on each of those different pods. And again, just to keep each port the same on both sides, we're going to say that you can access the cluster IP by accessing 5000 as well. Just as I said previously, there's really not a great reason at first glance to like, for some reason, change the port that the cluster IP accepts traffic on. So we're going to make sure that it's 5000 in both cases. All right, so let's get to it. I'm going to flip back over to my code editor inside of my k8s directory. I'm going to make a new file and I'm going to call this server-deployment.yaml. And then inside of here, we're going to put together some configuration that's going to look very, very similar to what we did in our client deployment just a moment ago. So we're get, again going to say API version, apps v1. We're going to have a type of deployment. For our metadata, we will provide a name of server deployment. And then we'll start to add on the spec that's going to customize exactly how this deployment behaves. So for my replicas, replicas, let's make sure we got the spelling correct. Again, this is the number of different pods that we're going to set up. We're just going to arbitrarily say that we want three pods running the multi-server image. We don't really know a whole lot about how to most appropriately scale these sets of pods yet. So maybe three is a good place to start. Maybe it's not, I don't know. We'll find it out when we actually deploy this thing and start to test our cluster with a little bit of traffic. Next up, we're going to specify the selector 
that the deployment is going to use to find the set of pods that it's supposed to control. So we're going to say that we want to match a set of labels, and then again, we'll do a component, but this time, rather than doing web as the value for the component key, I'll do a server like so. And so this is very clearly indicating that the component inside of our application that we are working on right here is the server. I want to remind you that the labels we put together can be anything you can possibly imagine. So we could just as easily do something like part of app API or something like that. But I personally enjoy this kind of component and then piece of the application terminology. I think that it's rather clear what this key value pair is indicating. Okay, so now that we got that put together, we're gonna go back out in indentation to be on the same indentation layer as the selector and replicas. And then we will put together our pod template. So we'll first begin with our metadata, excuse me, metadata that's going to specify our set of labels. And again, the labels that we apply to this thing must at least match up with whatever we put inside of the spec for the deployment itself. So for labels, I'll say component server, like so. All right, I'm gonna indent back out a little bit more. So now I am on the same indentation level as metadata, and we're going to provide the spec that's going to customize the exact behavior of each of the pods that gets created. Now we're going to, again, provide a list of containers that this pod is supposed to run. Just as before, we are only going to have one single container inside of this pod. We don't have any other containers that need to run along with the multi-server image. So I'll give a name of server. The image is going to be my Docker ID slash multi-server. And then the last thing that we're going to do for right now is to add on the list of ports that we want to make available. So for ports, I'm going to say that we want to have a container port accessible of 5,000, like so. All right, now I want to give you a quick reminder. The multi-server image that we put together does expect to get a handful of key value pairs along with it, or environment variables, that tells the multi-server or the Express API exactly how to connect to our Postgres instance and the Redis instance as well. So everything that we've put in together inside this file at this point in time is definitely stuff we have to add in here, but we are going to eventually come back and add on a series of environment variables that we want to make sure get injected into the container that is created with this image. And remember, the entire goal of that is that we're going to tell the Express API how to connect to Postgres and Redis. All right, so we are going to come back to this file, but for right now, I want to just focus on finishing up this very spe specific piece of our application setup for right now. And I don't want to think just yet about how we're going to involve Redis and Postgres in here just yet. Okay, so let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to put together our configuration file for the cluster IP service. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our deployment file for the multi-server set of pods. And we made sure that we specified that port 5000 should be accessible on the image that gets created inside of each of those pods. So we're now gonna create a second configuration file that's going to serve as what's going to create and maintain the cluster IP service. So I'm going to again flip back over to my code editor and inside of my k8s directory, I'm going to put together a new file that I will call server cluster IP service dot yaml. All right, and I'm gonna or actually I don't need to, I was gonna say I was gonna type out the name of the file right here just so you can see the whole thing, but you can actually see the whole name right here on the tab inside of my code editor, just in case you want to reference the exact name that I'm using. All right, so inside of here, we're going to put together another config file for a service of type cluster IP. This is again going to be just about identical to the previous cluster IP service we put together, but let's go through typing it all out again just to kind of commit this stuff to memory. It'll be pretty quick. So I'm going to provide an API version of v1. I'll provide a kind of service. For our metadata, we're going to specify the name of this service or this object. And I'm going to use a name of server cluster IP service, like so. And then we will provide a spec that's going to customize exactly how this server behaves, or excuse me, how this service behaves. So we're going to specify a type of service of cluster IP 
And then we need to provide a selector that's going to tell the service exactly what set of pods it's supposed to provide access to. And so of course, the cluster IP that we're putting together right now is supposed to provide access to all the multi-server pods. In just the last section, when we put together the server deployment file, we had assigned each of those pods a label of component server. And so inside of our server cluster IP service, we're going to want to specify a selector of component server. So back over here, I'll provide a selector of component server. And then finally, very similar to what we did last time, we're going to make sure that we specify the ports that the service is going to kind of mitigate control over or manage control over. So just as before, we're going to just send everything through. And as a reminder, the multi-server image listens for traffic on port 5000. So we're going to provide our ports with a port of 5000 and a target port of 5000 as well just as we did inside of our previous service. Okay, so that's it. That's all we have to do to put together our cluster IP service that's going to govern or manage access to our running Express API. So let's take a quick pause right here. I want to address one little side topic and then we'll continue with a couple more config files for the rest of all the objects inside of our application. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. When we first started working on taking our multi-container application and importing it into the world of Kubernetes a couple sections ago, I had told you that we were going to create one separate configuration file for every object that you see in this diagram right here. I think in total we had something like 11 or so. So that means that we're going to have 11 separate files sitting inside of this K8s directory, and each one of those separate files is going to create a separate piece or a separate object that's going to be running inside of our overall cluster. Now, at some point in time, it might seem like having to work with all of these different configuration files might be a little bit overwhelming. Everything that we've done up to this point has very clearly said that we're going to make a separate file for each object. But if it feels like that's just too many files for you to have to kind of manage and deal with, I want to tell you about one different way in which you can organize all of these different configuration files. So. Rather than putting a separate file for every separate object we create, we can actually combine different sets of configuration down into a single file. So as a alternative way of organizing your config files, rather than saying, okay, I need a file for cluster IP and a file for deployment, we actually can create one single file that contains all the configuration for both a cluster IP or a service and the deployment that it is associated with. There's no limit to the number of different pieces of config that we can stick into a single file. So you do not necessarily have to say, oh, this service is going to be in the same file as this deployment. We could just as easily say one single file is going to hold all the config for both these services and both these deployments. I'm gonna give you a very quick example of how you would combine these different config files together. And then I'll tell you why we are not doing that inside this course. Okay, so let's say for example, that we want to kind of co-locate all the configuration for our deployments and services that are tied to each one. So in other words, we might want to kind of consolidate the server cluster IP service and the server deployment config files down to one single file. So to do so, I could create a new file inside my K8s directory, and I'll call it something like, I don't know, server config or something like that. So server config.yaml. Then inside of here, I'm going to go back over to my deployment for the server. I'm gonna copy this entire thing, and then I'll paste it inside of the server config file that I just created. And then likewise, I'm gonna go back over to the cluster IP service for the server that we just put together a second ago. I'll copy this entire thing, and I'll pull it over to the server config.yaml file. And then down at the very bottom here, I'm going to put down slash, 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 or not slashes, but dashes, I suppose. So three dashes in a row like so. And then after that, I can paste in all the configuration for the other object that I'm trying to create. So it, essentially anytime that you want to kind of condense down all this config and put to multiple objects worth of configuration inside of a single file, you're just gonna paste everything inside of here and separate each one with the dash, dash, dash like so. Now for some of you watching this video, you might think, oh, that's great. I can make a single file that houses everything that's related to this piece of my application right here. 
But others of you might be thinking, well, how would I ever know where the configuration for this service is located? I would have to very actively understand that every service is tied to the related deployment. Now, that's really a question of preference. You don't have to co-locate all this configuration. I personally think that it makes a ton of sense to separate all the configuration out into separate files as we are doing right now, because it very clearly tells you how many different objects exist in your entire cluster. And the naming scheme that we're using right now also makes it extremely clear where the configuration for any given object can be found. For example, if you put this diagram or a diagram like this right here inside the readme of your project and another engineer comes and works on your project and says, oh, I need to like change a port related to the cluster IP service for the multi-client pod, they could very easily look at your list of config files right here and say, okay, client cluster IP service, well, of course, the configuration for that thing is going to be inside this file. And they instantly know where to look to find the configuration for any given object. If it wasn't for that, if you had combined everything into kind of single files or condensed everything down, they would have to understand that this cluster IP service and the deployment for the multi-client pods are in the same file. And so you would have to have some naming terminology for all of your config files that makes it really clear that like some particular file contains all the configuration for the multi-client pods, its deployment, and the service related to it as well. And so it's a little bit harder to come up with a naming scheme or a naming convention that makes it really clear that, hey, everything related to multi-client is inside of like XYZ file. Now, that's just my take. As I said, half of you might think that combining this stuff down into a single file makes a lot of sense. And the other half of you might think, no, that doesn't make any sense at all. I want to do everything inside of separate files. So like I said, I prefer to keep everything in separate files, but for you, totally up to you. Of course, throughout the rest of this course, I really recommend that you follow the same strategy as I and use a separate config file for each separate object. Okay, so that's my spiel on combining together config. Now I am going to delete the server config YAML file I just created because I had only made that as a very quick example to show you how to combine stuff together. So I'm going to make sure that I delete that file, and I'm now left with just four configuration files, the two client ones and the two server ones. All right, so let's take a quick pause right here and continue in the next section with our next piece of configuration. In this section, we're going to very quickly put the configuration together for our multi-worker deployment. After that, we're going to make sure that we take all of our different config files that we've put together and throw them all back into kubectl through that apply command and just get kind of a general idea of where all of our work is at. So let's put the configuration together for the multi-worker pod. As you might guess, this file is going to look very similar to the config that we put together for the other two deployments. So inside my k8s directory, I'm going to make a new file called workerdeployment.yaml. Then inside of here, we'll put together config very similar to the other deployments. We'll say API version is going to be apps v1. The kind of object that we are creating is a deployment. We'll give a metadata section to this thing with a name of worker dash deployment. And then we'll provide a spec to this thing as well. So for replicas, we're going to start off with just a single replica or a single pod running the multi-worker image. Remember that if there's anything inside of our application that really needs to scale out and have multiple instances, it probably is the multi-worker because that was the image or the container inside of our application that was doing that Fibonacci calculation. And that was the absolutely slowest part of our entire application. And so at one point in time, or at some point in time, we might want to come back and put a little bit more work into that thing to make sure that it is scaled properly. But for right now, we're going to start off with just a single replica so that we can eventually see that, yeah, this thing needs to be scaled and we can figure out how to do that at that point in time. All right, so after that, we'll provide our selector. We'll say that we want to attempt to match a label on some other object inside of our cluster. And for this one, we'll give a component of worker because that's really its job. It is a worker container inside of our application. After that, we'll put together our template for the pods that are created. Remember that the template property goes on the same indentation layer as selector. We'll provide a metadata to the template where we will provide the different labels that need to be applied to every pod that gets created. And of course, we're going to provide a label that matches the selector that we had specified just a second ago. So under labels, I'll say component worker. 
After that, I'll unindent back out to the metadata section or metadata kind of indentation layer, I suppose, and we'll provide a spec that's going to configure exactly what this pod is running. So we're going to say that we want to run a single container, but remember it is plural, containers like so. And then the single container that we want to run is going to have a name of worker. It's going to use the image of your Docker ID, multi worker. And then just as before, we are going to eventually need to stuff in some environment variables into this thing to tell it how to connect to Redis. But for right now, we're just going to kind of ignore that for a second. We're going to first set up Redis and make sure that's working correctly. And then we're going to come back to both our worker and express API deployments and add in the environment variables at that point in time. Now, the other thing I want to mention here is if you look at this diagram, remember there is nothing inside of our worker image or the worker container that's running here that needs to be accessible from anything else inside of our cluster. In other words, there's no other object whatsoever, no other service, no other image, no container, no nothing that needs to directly connect to the multi-worker and try to get some information out of it. The multi-worker is going to connect to something else inside of our application, but nothing is going to make a unprompted request into the multi-worker. And as such, the multi-worker does not need to have any port assigned to it, and it does not need to have any service assigned to it either. We only make use of services when we want to have requests going into a set of pods or into a single pod for that matter. And because that's not the case here, no need for a service, no need to worry about any ports. Okay, so with that in mind, that's pretty much it for this file. No ports required. So we're just going to finish it off like so, and we do not need to create a associated service file. So let's save this as is. We'll take a quick pause right here, and when we come back in the next section, we're going to take the three config files that we just put together in the last couple of videos and throw them into kubectl through the apply command. So quick break, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last couple of videos, we put together a set of three different config files. So one for the worker and two for our server. We're now gonna flip back over to our command line and use kubectl apply to take those three new config files and apply them to our cluster. We're just going to make sure that there's no distinct error messages or that we didn't make any big typos or anything like that. Now, when we launch these different deployments, it's entirely possible that they're just going to crash and burn because we have not yet set up any environment variables to tell the worker or the server how to connect to Redis or Postgres because we haven't even set those things up yet. So if the deployments or the pods that they are running just crash and burn horribly, that's totally fine. What we're doing right now is just checking to see if we have any typos or anything like that. So I'm gonna flip over to my terminal. I'm gonna make sure that I'm inside of my complex directory and then I'm going to apply the entire K8s directory again. So remember, we do not need to pass in one file at a time. We can pass in a whole directory. When we apply that directory, we're also going to be reapplying the two client files that we had already applied previously, but that's totally okay, because remember, when Kubernetes gets a config file, it's gonna look at the name of the object we're trying to create and its type. And if a object inside of our cluster already exists with the same name and the type, an additional object will not be created. Kubernetes is just going to try to update that existing object if there's any difference inside of the config file. So what I mean to say by all this is that whenever we make a change to our config file or any time that we create a new one or whatever it might be, we can pretty safely just take the entire KEDS directory and apply everything in there and generally be okay. Now there definitely are some side effects to that later on when we start adding in a couple more advanced objects that we're gonna do much later in the course. But at least for right now, when we're only working with deployments and services, kind of free form, you can just throw everything inside of your config directory into kubectl and you're going to be okay. All right, so enough talking. We're gonna do kubectl apply f k8s, like so. Now you'll notice that Kubernetes very correctly noticed that there are already two objects inside the cluster with the type and name of both these services right here, or both those objects, and the config associated with both of them has not been changed by any stretch of the imagination. So those are totally unchanged. However, the three other objects here are being created. Let's now do a kubectl get pods. And so we'll, we will see a list of all the different pods that have been created. It looks like we have the server and the worker running here successfully. So even though I kind of thought that they were gonna crash and burn, it looks like they're doing okay. We can do a get deployments and see that we now have a total of three deployments. 
And then finally, we can do a get services and see that we have both the original client cluster IP service and the new server cluster IP service. Now, as a quick reminder, we could very quickly use the kubectl logs command to try to pull some logging information out of these new pods and kind of get a better sense of whether or not they are working correctly. We could also choose to reconfigure our Docker client to directly access the containers that are running the multi-server and the multi-worker images and pull logs that way. It's totally up to you. But just because it's a little bit easier, I'm going to pull logs using the kubectl CLI. So I'll first print out my list of pods again, and then I'll just take the name of one of these random deploy, or excuse me, yeah, one of the random pods right here. I saw the word deployment and confused myself for a second, but we're good. So I'm gonna take the name right there. I'm gonna copy it, and then I'll do a kubectl logs, and then the name like so. All right, so we can see that in fact, Node.js was executed, and that is our default npm start command. That's what we expect to see. But then very shortly after that, we saw a refuse to connect right here. Now the refuse to connect is coming directly from us trying to connect to Redis, but no copy of Redis is available. You'll notice that it did default to using port 5432. It only defaulted to that because the Redis library that we are using inside of that image defaults to use port 5432. So even though we didn't specify a port yet for this server to connect to, it just defaulted to 5432. And of course, when we eventually add in an environment variable to specify the port, even though it has a default, we're still going to make sure that we very di directly and distinctly say it's supposed to be port 5432. All right, so it looks like everything is running as well as can be expected. So we're gonna take another quick break right here. When we come back to the next section, we'll put together another set of config files for Redis, and then we'll eventually move on to Postgres as well. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, I've got some really good news and some bad news. So the good news is that we get to put together our configuration for the Redis deployment that's going to manage a single Redis pod. The bad news is that that means we have to write out two more configuration files, very similar to the ones we've already put together. So I know writing out all these configuration files is getting very tedious, but we're almost at the end here. We just have to do the Redis deployment, its cluster IP service, and then the same thing for Postgres and its service as well. And then after that, we're done with these very repetitive config files. And we get to look at some more interesting config files that are going to do some more interesting things inside of our cluster. So let's get to it. We're going to create our deployment config file for Redis and its associated cluster IP service. All right, inside of my code editor, I'll find my K8s directory. And inside there, I'll make a new file called redis deployment.yaml. So we're going to start off first with the deployment. Now the deployment that we're going to put together is going to look essentially identical to the other ones that we've already written so far. So let's get through it as quickly as we can, but do make sure that you type out everything correctly because any little typo is going to eventually result in some error message down the line. All right, so I'll do an API version of apps v1. I'll give this object a type of deployment. I'll set up a metadata that's going to provide a name of Redis deployment, and then we'll start putting together some configuration that's going to exactly configure how the deployment is created and how it behaves. So for my spec, I'm going to give a replicas of one. We only want to have one single copy of Redis at any given time. Now Redis is very interesting in that we can set it up in a sort of cluster mode where there will be multiple copies of Redis that kind of communicate with each other and enhance the overall stability and throughput of our application. But this is of course much more about Kubernetes than it is about Redis. So we're not gonna worry about setting up Redis in, sort, in any sort of like cluster mode or anything like that. So we're just gonna have one standalone copy of Redis. All right, we'll also give it a selector it's going to look for any set of pods out there that has a label of component Redis. I'll then unindent back out to be on the same indentation level as selector and we'll provide our pod template. So for the pod template, we want to give it some metadata. Notably, we want it to have a set of labels of component Redis, like so. I'm then going to unindent again so that I'm on the same indentation level as metadata and we'll provide the pod a spec. So it's gonna have a single container, but remember the keyword right here is containers, plural, even though we only have one. So we'll give this thing a name of Redis. 
it's going to use the image Redis, the no Docker ID required this time, like you know your Docker ID slash, because we don't have our own custom version of Redis. We are using the copy that is included in the public repository over on Docker Hub. We'll then set up the different ports that need to be mapped to the container. In the case of Redis, the default port that it uses is 6379. And there's really no good reason for us to try to change that. Totally fine to use the default port. So I'll set up a container port of 6379, like so. All right, again, I got to ask you, please double check all the indentation and all the spelling inside this file, because if anything inside of here is wrong, like any little typo whatsoever is going to eventually result in an error message. Like literally, if I change anything inside of here, like if I delete a P in component or something like that, something down the line is not going to work as expected. So please double check your spelling inside this file. All right, so that's de the deployment. So we're now going to create a cluster IP so that our server pods and the multi-worker pod can eventually connect to this Redis instance that's running inside of the pod, inside of a container inside of the pod. So back inside of my code editor, I'll find my K8s directory. I'm gonna make a new file called Redis cluster IP service .yaml. And then inside of here, we'll put together the config to make a new cluster IP service. And again, it's gonna be identical to the other ones we've already put together. So let's get through this quickly as well. We'll do our API version of V1. We are making a service. It's gonna have metadata with a name of Redis service. Actually, I think that, what was the terminology we've been using? Cluster IP service. Let's make sure that we stay very consistent here. So I'll do Redis cluster IP service like so. I'll then give it a spec with a type of cluster IP. We'll make sure that we provide the selector so that this service knows what set of pods it is managing access to. So it's going to be component Redis. And then finally, we need to designate what set of ports this service is going to manage. So I'll say ports. Any outside object that is trying to get at our Redis pod is going to access this thing on port 6379. And then after it goes through the service, we're just going to let it stick with 6379 and have that port be what it connects to inside of our container. So I'll do a target port of 6379 as well, like so. Again, no good reason to try to redirect the ports here. There are situations where you would want to do that. For example, if we have an Nginx server that is supposed to be serving up web traffic on like port 80 or something like that. But for whatever reason, we have configured Nginx to listen on port 3000, which is actually something we kind of did on the React application, but the React application is not directly receiving traffic. It's kind of backed behind that ingress thing that we're going to eventually set up as well. But if that were the case, then we could do that little bit of port redirection and not have to reconfigure our image or anything like that. Okay, so this looks pretty good. Now, the last thing I wanna do is load this up into kubectl as well with the apply command. So I'll flip back over to my terminal. There's the k8s directory. I'll do a kubectl apply dash f k8s. We're just gonna throw everything inside there. We should probably see a bunch of different objects that are going to end up unchanged like so. But then the two new config files that we just made will be reflected as objects created inside this log. And so just as before, we can do a quick get pods and verify that, yep, we've got a single copy of Redis up and running. And we can also do a get services and verify that our Redis cluster IP service is up and running as well on port 6379. Okay, so this looks good. Now we've only got one last set of config files for Postgres along with this associated cluster IP. So let's get through that in the last section. I know this stuff is so tedious with all this writing of identical files, but we're almost done with that. So let's finish up these last two config files in the next section. And then we get to get back to some more interesting topics in the world of Kubernetes. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In this section, we're going to get through our last set of boring config for the Postgres deployment and its associated cluster IP service. So I'm sure you don't need any clever or witty comments from me at this point. I'm sure you just wanna get this stuff done. So let's get to it. I'm gonna flip on over to my code editor inside of my K8s directory. We'll do our Postgres deployment.yaml file. 
Now, again, this is going to be a file that's very much identical to the Redis stuff that we just put together and even the other different objects we had put together before that. I still do not recommend that you ever do a copy paste of these config files just because it's so incredibly easy to forget to update some specific property. Far safer to just rewrite it, but that's just my personal opinion. All right, so we'll do our API version of apps v1 for our deployment. This is going to be an object with a type of deployment. We'll set up our metadata, if I can spell it correctly, with the name of Postgres deployment. And then we'll set up our spec that's going to configure the deployment itself. So I again want to only have one replica running of my Postgres container inside of its given pod. Just very much like our Redis deployment that we just put together, we technically can create Postgres in a sort of cluster of different instances that are going to all work together to increase the availability and bandwidth of our database. However, again, that's something that's kind of outside the realm of Kubernetes that we're talking about right now. So we're just going to focus on running a single replica as it stands. After that, we'll put down our selector. We're going to say, look for a label that is matching component Postgres. We'll then set up our pod template. So we'll give it a metadata property with labels of component Postgres. And then again, I'm going to make sure that I unindent back to be on the same indentation level as metadata. We'll define our spec for all the different pods that get created by this deployment. I'll say, here's our list of containers. I want it to have a name of Postgres. I want to use the image Postgres. And then finally, we're going to set up the ports here as well. So the default port with Postgres, which we are using, we're not going to reconfigure or anything like that. We'll set up a container port of 5432. Again, default port for Postgres. All right, so that looks good. Now remember, very similarly to all the like Redis and Express API stuff that we had done previously, to get our Express and our worker pods up and working correctly, or more specifically the containers inside there, they need to have that set of environment variables that are going to make sure that they can successfully connect to this copy of Postgres. So we do have to set up a little bit of environment variables, not only inside of this file, but inside of the worker and server deployments as well. We're going to take care of that in just a second, but for right now, I want to first put together the cluster IP service, and then we'll come back and talk about all these environment variables and this PVC thing and all that stuff. Essentially, I just wanted to get the boring parts out of the way here at the very start of these repetitive config files and then go over to the more interesting stuff like the environment variables and the Postgres persistent volume claim. All right, so that's our deployment. We're going to also make inside of our K8s directory the Postgres cluster IP service .yaml file. And inside of here, completely identical to the Postgres one we just, or excuse me, the Redis one we just put together. I'll do an API version of v1. We are making a service that will have a metadata name of Postgres cluster IP service. And we'll give it a spec with the type of cluster IP. And then finally, to make sure that, or not finally, we have two other properties to do here, but one of the two is going to be the selector where we'll tell this thing what set of pods it's going to look for. And as usual, we'll give it component along with the name or the label that we had applied to it, which was Postgres, as we can verify back inside of our template section over here inside the deployment. All right, so now the real last step, for real this time around, we're going to set up our ports. We're going to say the default port of 5432 to connect to Redis, and we're not going to do any type of remapping this time around as well. Uh, target port. There we go. All right, so that looks like it's just about it. Now let's take these two new configuration files and we're going to apply them to kubectl as well. And then we'll check out our different sets of pods and make sure that everything is running successfully before we start to come back and take care of the Postgres persistent volume claim thing and some environment variables as well. So at my terminal, still inside of my complex directory, we'll do our kubectl apply. K8s. Now we should see that we have the Postgres IP service and the Postgres deployment as well. So just as before, we'll do our get pods. And now one of these names is really long, so it wants to kind of wrap the levels with me. So I can see my Postgres deployment right here. The container is being created. 
I'll do Git pods again, and I can now see that it is in fact up and running for the Postgres deployment. And I'll make sure that I do my Git services as well. And somewhere inside of here, Postgres cluster IP service. Very good. And I got pop port 5432. All right, so I think that we are pretty much all set. So that's just about it on our very basic, very simplistic config files for all the different deployments and associated services. So let's take a pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna talk about some additional work that we need to do to make sure that the server can connect to Redis and Postgres, and to make sure that the worker can connect to Redis as well. And also, let's not forget this little PVC thing down here. Okay, so quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we finished up with our Postgres deployment file and the associated cluster IP service as well. So that's pretty much it for the boring configuration files, at least the ones around the cluster IP service and deployments. We're still going to write out a couple of different config files, but they're going to be much different than the ones we put together so far, because they're going to serve dramatically different purposes than the services and deployments we've taken a look at. In this section in particular, we're going to start looking at what a Postgres PVC thing down here is. First beginning by getting a better understanding on why we need this PVC thing at all. So just so you know, PVC stands for Persistent Volume Claim. Now the word volume in here is the same type of volume that we had worked back with in the world of Docker and Docker Compose a while ago. You might recall that we had previously made use of volumes in order to share the file system of a host operating system or a host machine with the file system inside of a container. And so we had previously used it with Docker Compose when we were working on that Create React app. We had wanted to make sure that every time we changed the source code of our project on our local machine, it somehow updated the files inside of the container as well. Now, to give you a good idea of what a persistent volume claim is, I first want to do a very quick review on what a volume is and why we need a volume at all with Postgres in particular. Because if we just start talking about what a volume claim is without really understanding and remembering what a volume is, a lot of this stuff won't make sense. So in this section, quick review on volumes and why we need one with Postgres. All right. Now, I just took the diagram we were looking at a second ago, like this big one right here, in particular, the deployment and Postgres pod piece, and I blew it up to be its own kind of diagram right here, as you see. So we still have the deployment, which creates a pod, and inside that pod, we have a single Postgres container. And inside that container is a file system totally isolated to just be accessible by the container itself. Now, I want you to recall that Postgres is a database, and the Postgres database, very similar to many other types of databases, though not relevant for Redis because that is specifically an in-memory data store, Postgres takes in some amount of data and writes it to a file system. So we can imagine that a request to write some data or essentially save some data with Postgres comes into the container. Postgres is going to process it and then eventually say, okay, I want to store this information on a file system or a hard drive of sorts. So inside that container, we can imagine that there is that file system and some amount of data is being stored on it. Now, here's the thing to keep in mind about any file system that is created in or maintained inside of a container. If we ever had a situation where for if any reason you can possibly imagine this Postgres container or the pod kind of wrapping it and managing it crashes, then everything over here gets 100% lost, including the file system that exists inside of the Postgres container. So if we just use our copy of Postgres as it stands right now, like this single deployment with this pod inside of it and no associated bells or whistles or volumes and stuff associated with it, if we just write data to Postgres and then that pod or that container eventually crashes, that entire pod is going to be deleted by the deployment. And a brand new pod is going to be created in its place. And this new pod is going to have absolutely no carryover of data. So none of the data on the file system of the original container gets brought over to this new container or the pod that wraps it. So essentially, the instant that the deployment starts up a new pod, we lose all the data sitting inside of our database. And as you might guess, that is 100% not something we want to ever deal with. We never want to experience any type of data loss with any database such as Postgres. So that's the issue. If we just let 
Postgres save all of its data inside the file system maintained by the container. We're going to lose it as soon as this pod crashes or the container crashes. And we have to absolutely assume that that might happen at some point in time. So how are we going to solve this? Well, recall that is where volumes come in. Now, when we had previously used volumes, it was all in the context of kind of being allowed to make changes to our source code files and have them show up inside the container. But we can also make use of volumes to have a consistent file system that can be accessed by a database such as Postgres. So we can now imagine that with a volume in place that is running on a host machine, if we have a request to write data that comes into the container, Postgres is going to think that it's writing it to a file system that exists inside the container, but in reality, it's going to be a volume that actually exists outside on the host machine. The result of this is that if our original pod or the Postgres container inside of it crashes for whatever reason whatsoever, the deployment is going to delete that thing and then create a brand new pod with a brand new copy of Postgres inside of it. But we're going to make sure that this new copy of Postgres that gets created gets access to the exact same volume. And so we'll have access to all of the data that had been written by the previous copy of Postgres that already existed. So that's the idea behind a volume, and that's how we're going to allow ourselves to save some amount of data with a database, but not have to worry about all the data inside there being deleted anytime that the container has to be restarted or crashes or whatever reason, whatever might happen. Now, one quick thing that I want to mention here, you'll notice that inside of our Postgres deployment, you'll recall we put down replicas of one right here. Now, I want you to recall that I told you, yeah, we can set up Postgres to have like some amount of replication or clustering that's going to improve the availability and performance of our database. Just to make sure it's really clear, if we just like bump that up to replicas like two right there, we would end up with a situation like this, where we have two pods that might be accessing the same volume. Having two different databases access the same file system without them being aware of each other and have them very distinctly cooperating with each other is a recipe for disaster. So at no point in time are you ever going to want to just arbitrarily dial up replicas to two like so and attempt to have two copies of Postgres accessing the same volume. Now that's not just isolated to the world of Postgres. Many other databases, you're going to find the same problem. So for whatever, whatever reason you want to scale up your copy of Postgres and make it more available by having more copies of it running or whatever it might be, you have to go through some additional configuration steps besides just incrementing that replicas number right there. So again, I just want to make sure that was really, really, really clear. Okay, so now that we recall why we make use of volumes and why a volume is so important to use with a database, let's continue in the next section where we're going to start to talk about exactly what a persistent volume claim is and how it's going to assist us in setting up a volume for our Postgres pod. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about how we might use volumes as a way of persisting data outside of a container when that data is something that we care about and we want to have be persisted across restarts or termination of a given container, specifically, or most especially ones that are running a database of some sort. Now in this section, we're going to start talking about volumes in the world of Kubernetes. The first thing I want to clarify is a little piece of terminology. It's actually the word volume itself. I want to tell you a little bit about what the word volume means in the world of Kubernetes. All right, so first things first, there's a little discussion about terminology. In the last section, I was using the word volume over and over and over again. When I was using the word volume in the last section, it was kind of as a generic term in container terminology world. And it was a reference to some type of data storage mechanism that allows a container to store data outside of its own little file system. However, in the world of Kubernetes, the term volume is a reference to a very particular type of object. An object in the same sense that a deployment is an object or a service is an object. So in the world of Kubernetes, we can write a configuration file that will create something called a volume. In Kubernetes, that object is a something that allows a container to store some persistent data at the pod level. In addition to the use of volumes, we also have access to two other types of data storage mechanisms, both something called a persistent volume claim and a persistent volume. 
So in this section, I want to expand upon what a volume is in the world of Kubernetes just a little bit so that you understand that when we use the word volume with Kubernetes, it's a reference to a very particular thing. And it's very different than referring to something called a persistent volume or a persistent volume claim. Now we're not gonna make use of volumes for everything that we're doing. We're not gonna use volumes at all. I just want you to understand that this is a completely separate thing. And so when you start to look at documentation and you see documentation that says, oh yeah, create a volume, you have to create a distinction between what a volume is and a persistent volume is. Otherwise, when you're reading that documentation, you're gonna get really, really confused. Okay, so with that in mind, this section, we're gonna look at a diagram that explains exactly what a volume object type is in Kubernetes. All right. So I want to again consider our Postgres deployment. Let's imagine we have a deployment that manages a single pod, and that pod has a single Postgres container. When we create a volume in Kubernetes, we are creating a little kind of data storage pocket that exists or is tied directly to a very specific pod. So you'll notice in this diagram, I'm reflecting this volume right here that's going to store some amount of data as being kind of like inside the pod. It's essentially kind of like belongs to or is associated to the pod in some fashion. Now this volume can be accessed by any container inside of the pod. So for example, if we had a Postgres container running, it could store all of its data inside of this volume that belongs to the pod itself. Now the benefit to using this volume here is that if this container, like this one specifically, ever dies or crashes and gets restarted as a completely new container, like so, you know, let's imagine that we get a second Postgres container and the old one gets killed. So I'm going to mark it as red right there. Then this new Postgres container has access to all of that data in that volume. And so that might sound like exactly what we were just talking about in the last section. You know, we're essentially saying, oh yeah, new container gets created. Well, the new container gets access to that same volume and it has access to all the data that the previous container had access to as well. However, here's the downside. The volume is tied to the pod. And so if the pod itself ever dies, the volume dies and goes away as well. So a volume in Kubernetes will survive container restarts inside of a pod, but if the pod itself, for whatever reason, ever gets recreated or terminated, deleted, whatever happens, then the pod and the volume inside of it, poof, totally gone. And then, of course, the deployment would kick in and recreate that pod with a volume inside of it. So as you might guess, in the world of Kubernetes, a volume is really not appropriate for storing data from a, for a database. It definitely works in the sense that the container can restart, but we still are weak or we're still kind of vulnerable to anything going wrong at the pod level itself. All right, so that's why we're not going to use volumes. And just in, so you know, in real life, as I say volume, I'm doing like, you know, double quotes around myself to say, you know, specifically a Kubernetes volume. That's why we are not using a Kubernetes volume. All right. So now that we've clarified that little piece of terminology, we're going to come back to the next section and we'll talk more about exactly what a persistent volume is and a persistent volume claim. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about what a volume is in the world of Kubernetes. We're now going to start to talk about these two other types of objects that we can create as well, a persistent volume claim and a persistent volume. We'll first begin by comparing and contrasting the differences between a persistent volume and a volume. So quick diagram to figure out what the differences between these two are. All right, so in this diagram, on the left-hand side, we have a Postgres deployment with a volume. That's exactly what we were talking about in the last section. We had said that a volume is going to be some long-term storage that is tied to a pod Whenever the pod is created, the volume is created. If a container crashes for any reason, the volume will stick around, the volume will persist. And so we had said that if we end up with a new Postgres container for whatever reason, no problem, it can freely connect back to this existing volume that had been created. And so we can kind of imagine that the old container might fall away and it gets replaced with this new one, still gets access to all that volume data. However, if the entire pod crashes for any reason, everything inside the pod is lost, including that volume. All right, so that's a volume. That's what we spoke about in the last section. So now let's compare and contrast that against a persistent volume. 
With a persistent volume, we are creating some type of long-term durable storage that is not tied to any specific pod or any specific container. So you can kind of imagine that the persistent volume is outside the pod, completely separate from the pod. If this container crashes for any reason, or if it needs to be created, recreated for any reason, no problem whatsoever, the old container will fall away, and the new one can connect to that persistent volume that exists outside the pod. Now let's consider the other case, the case in which maybe a pod needs to be deleted or recreated for some fashion, for some reason, excuse me. So we can kind of imagine that if this pod crashes entirely and gets recreated, no problem whatsoever, the old pod falls away, it completely disappears, but the persistent volume is still going to stick around. When the new pod is created with a new copy of Postgres, that container is going to be able to connect to that persistent volume that exists outside of the pod. So that's the big difference between a normal volume and a persistent volume. Essentially, we're talking about the life cycle of the volume itself. With a normal volume, it's tied to the life cycle of the pod. With a persistent volume, it's going to last for all time, or essentially until you and I as developers or as the administrators decide to delete it for some reason. But with a persistent volume, we can recreate a container, we can recreate a pod, no problem. The volume is still going to stick around with all the data that you would expect to have. All right, so that's the differences between a persistent volume and a volume. So let's take another quick break right here, and we'll talk about what the differences are between a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. So quick pause, and I'll catch you in just a second. In the last section, we spoke about what a volume is compared to a persistent volume. We're now going to pivot a little bit and talk about how a persistent volume claim compares to a persistent volume. Now, these two topics right here and their relation with each other is kind of hard to understand at first glance. So I'm going to give you a very quick analogy or a very quick story to help you understand what the difference is between a volume claim and a persistent volume. After I give you the analogy, we'll then kind of take this little short story and pivot it over to the world of Kubernetes and apply some real terminology to it. So in this section, let's get to it. We're going to look at a very quick little short story to help you understand the difference between a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. So here's my short story. I want you to imagine that you are walking down a sidewalk and you are in the process of building out some custom computer. You are building a computer from scratch. And so maybe at this point in time, you have a case and a motherboard and a processor, some RAM and a graphics card. And the last thing that you need might be some type of hard drive. So you're walking along with your custom PC and you see a big billboard that says, come on down to the computer store. We have two really great hard drives that are available. We have a 500 gigabyte option and a one terabyte option. So you look at this billboard right here and you say, you know what? Between these two options, I think that 500 gigabyte hard drive would be perfect for my custom computer. So you take your custom computer, you continue walking down the sidewalk until you get to the computer store. Now at the computer store, you talk to a salesperson and you say, hey, you know, I just saw that billboard where you were advertising the 500 gigabyte option. I would love to have one of those hard drives. So the salesperson says, not a problem. And they turn around and they go to some storeroom or some like inventory store inside the computer store and they look through all the different pieces of hardware that they have available. Now you had asked for a 500 gigabyte hard drive. So the salesperson says, great, this is perfect. I can meet your request right now. I've got a 500 gigabyte hard drive ready to go. And so they throw that thing over to you and you now have a 500 gigabyte hard drive that you can put into your computer. All right, so that's the entire short story. That's kind of scenario one. Now, I want to very quickly go through the same scenario again, but we're going to imagine that rather than asking for a 500 gigabyte hard drive, maybe this time around you ask for a one terabyte hard drive instead. So we're going to do a second flow through this diagram. And imagine that you instead decide you want the one terabyte drive. So in this case, you are again walking down the sidewalk, you see the billboard, and you see that there is a one terabyte hard drive storage option. You say, oh, that's perfect. I would love to have a one terabyte hard drive. So you walk down to the computer store a second time and you say to the salesperson, hey, you know, I would love to get one of those one terabyte hard drives. And the salesperson says, okay, sure. Let me just check the storeroom really quick. So the salesperson goes back to the storeroom 
and I look at all the hard drives that they already have in stock. So these hard drives right here inside the storeroom are essentially hard drives that have already been created. They are in existence already. The salesperson looks through all the stock that they have and they very quickly realize, oh no, there is no one terabyte hard drive on stock, on hand, ready to be sold. But the salesperson is not going to give up very easily. The salesperson says, you know what, I'm going to make sure you get what you asked for because we were advertising that as an option. So the salesperson picks up the phone and very quickly makes a call out to the hard drive factory. They call the factory and they say, hey, look, I got someone right here. They want a one terabyte hard drive. I need you to create this thing right now and ship it on over. And so the factory puts that hard drive together, lickety split just as fast as you blink, and they ship it on over to the computer store. And so now the salesperson has your one terabyte hard drive that was fabricated on the fly just for you. And they hand the hard drive over and you are now a happy little camper because you have the one terabyte hard drive that you were asking for. All right, so that's the entire story, two run, th run throughs. Now there's a couple of very quick important points that I want to highlight here. The first important point is that we had a billboard that was essentially advertising storage options that were available. The second important thing is that for those two storage options, some of them were ready to go and pre-assembled. So there were some instances of 500 gigabyte hard drives that had already been created and were ready to be handed off to you, the customer. There were also some storage options that had been advertised on that billboard that were not ready to go and had to be essentially fabricated or created on the fly to meet your demand. So whether it was a hard drive option that was ready to go or one that had to be fabricated on the fly, no big difference to you, the customer. Either way, you got what you were asking for. All right, so that's the two big points I want you to understand. So we're now going to look at another copy of this diagram that has some Kubernetes terminology applied to it. Okay, so here's the Kubernetes version of this diagram. So first off, you in the previous diagram were putting together a computer and you had realized that you needed a hard drive. That's very similar to you and I as developers putting together a pod configuration. When you and I put together a pod that we know is going to need a persistent volume, we have to look at a billboard of sorts that's going to advertise a couple of different storage options. So these different storage options that are being advertised are what we refer to as persistent volume claims. So a persistent volume claim is an advertisement. It is not an actual volume. It can't store anything. It's just an advertisement that says, here are the different options that you have access to for storage inside of this particular cluster. You and I, as developers, are going to write out inside of some config files the different persistent volume claims that are going to be available inside of our cluster. So you and I are going to write a config file that says there should be a 500 gigabyte hard drive option available to all the different pods inside of our cluster. And we might also write out a config file that says there is a one terabyte option that is available as well. So again, a persistent volume claim is like an advertisement. It's saying, here is something that you can purchase. Here is something you can get for your pod when it is created. Now, when you chose one of those persistent volumes, you went off to Kubernetes with your pod config and you said to Kubernetes, which was the salesperson in reality, hey, I just saw that 500 gigabyte hard drive option. And you said to Kubernetes, hey, I want that 500 gigabyte option. Give me one of those. And so Kubernetes had to go back into some imaginary store and it had to look through some number of options of persistent volumes or storage options, instances of storage options that were readily available. And so inside of a Kubernetes cluster, we might have some number of persistent volumes that have been created ahead of time. These are actual instances of hard drives essentially that can be used right away for storage. Any persistent volume that is created ahead of time inside of your cluster is something that we refer to as statically provisioned. So a statically provisioned persistent volume is something that we have very specifically created ahead of time. On the other hand, we also had a, another option that could have been created on the fly. So this is what we refer to as a dynamically prov provisioned persistent volume. It is another storage option that is not created ahead of time. It's only created when you, 
putting together your pod, ask for it. So you can totally ask for this one terabyte hard drive. You know, you can say to Kubernetes, give me that one terabyte option, but that one terabyte hard drive was not going to be created until you went ahead and asked for it. So that's the difference between a dynamically provisioned and a statically provisioned persistent volume. Is it created ahead of time or is it created just when you immediately ask for it? All right, so that's it. That's the big difference between a persistent volume and a persistent volume claim. The persistent volume claim is a advertisement of options. You can ask for one of those options inside of your pod config. And when you do, Kubernetes is going to look at its existing stores of persistent volume, and it's either going to give you a volume that's been created ahead of time, or it's going to attempt to create one on the fly. So there's the entire example. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to start to update our config files to create a new persistent volume claim that's going to create a storage option that can be claimed essentially by our Postgres pod that we had already created. So quick break and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about the big differences between a persistent volume claim and a persistent volume. Remember, a volume claim is an advertisement. It is saying, hey, all the pods inside this cluster, you can choose from a 500 gigabyte option or a one terabyte option. When we write our, our pod config, we are gonna say, hey, this pod needs the 500 gigabyte option. And so you can kind of imagine that our pod config is going to be handed off to Kubernetes with this kind of option tied to it. Kubernetes is going to see that option and it's going to say, oh, okay, I get it. I need to find an actual instance of storage inside of my cluster that meets these requirements. It has to have 500 gigabytes worth of storage. If Kubernetes does not have a instance of storage like that ready to go, then it's going to try to create one on the fly and then attach it to the pod that gets created. Now, I can give you diagrams about this stuff all day and verbal descriptions all day, but to really understand this stuff, you really have to put together a config file on your own. So in this section, we're going to write out a persistent volume claim. And remember, this is going to essentially advertise a possible storage option that can be attached to a pod config. So inside of my code editor, I'm gonna find my k8s directory. And inside of here, I'm going to make a new file called database persistent volume claim.yaml. Now I typed that out rather quickly. Remember that you can always see my file name at the top here inside this tab. All right, so inside of here, we're gonna write out a pretty good amount of config. Some of it is gonna look very familiar and some of it is going to be a little bit new. So we'll do the familiar stuff first. I'll say API version is V1. Our kind will be persistent volume claim. We'll do a metadata that has a name of database persistent volume claim, and then we'll add a spec. So the spec is where some interesting things start to come into play. I think you'll agree with me that everything up here looks pretty darn familiar. So for our spec, we're going to give an access modes. Notice how there's an S on there. This is going to be an array. So I'm gonna put a dash in like so, and then I'm gonna give this a single value I'll say read write once. On the next line, I'm going to unindent so that I'm on the same indentation level as access modes. I'll do resources, requests, storage is to GI, like so. Okay, so that's it. That is all the config that we need for our persistent volume claim. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we'll talk about exactly what is going on inside the spec section. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we put together our first persistent volume claim. Now, before we talk about what the spec stuff inside of here is, I want to give you a very quick reminder. Remember that a volume claim is not an actual instance of storage. A volume claim is something that we are going to attach to a pod config. So back in our example over here, we would take this volume claim that says, hey, I can get you a 500 gigabyte hard drive, and we attach it to our pod config. Then at some point in time, we take that pod config and we hand it off to Kubernetes. Kubernetes is going to see that storage option, it's gonna see that volume claim, and it's going to try to find either a statically provisioned persistent volume or a dynamically prov provisioned persistent volume to meet the requirements of that claim. 
So all the config that you and I have now added in underneath the spec section is saying that if we attach this claim to a pod, Kubernetes must find an instance of storage, like a slice of your hard drive that meets these requirements. So with that in mind, let's talk about what an access mode is. All right, so access modes. We get three different types of access modes. The one that we used is read write once. Read write once means that we want to get some instance of storage, like a slice of your hard drive, that can be used by a single node at a time. And to be precise, this that single node can use it and both read and write information to that volume. We also get access to an access mode of read only many, which means that multiple nodes at the same time can read information from this persistent volume. And then finally, read write many means that we can both read and write information to this persistent volume by many nodes at the same time. Now, again, I want to really, really highlight the fact that the access mode that we put in right here says, if you attach me to a pod config and then hand me off to Kubernetes, Kubernetes is going to have to find an instance of storage that supports this access mode. All right, so let's now move on to resources down here. Now, I bet you can really guess what's going on here. So with storage, we're essentially saying that Kubernetes is going to have to find a storage option, either one that has been provisioned ahead of time or one that is going to be created on the fly that has at least two gigabytes of space. Or to be exact, it has to have exactly two gigabytes of space. We could very easily change this number around. You know, we can say 1,000 gigabytes or four six, whatever you want it to be. But for us, two is way more than what is needed to put together our very simple Postgres database. In fact, you know, we're going to use like fractions of a kilobyte. So two gigabytes is way overkill for our application, but I just want to give you an example with a gigabyte option here. Okay, so these two options right here, pretty straightforward in nature. Again, they are saying, hey, Kubernetes, you have to find a storage instance that has this access mode, and it has to have exactly two gigabytes worth of storage. Now, there's a couple of other options that we can add into this file that we did not because we're going to rely upon the defaults. But these other storage options that we did not list out are pretty important to understand. So let's take a quick break. When we come back to the next section, we'll talk about some other possible options that we could put into the spec if you had need to do so. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we spoke about some of the different config that we put into our persistent volume claim. Now, at the end of the last section, I had mentioned that there are some other possible options that we could put inside of here. We did not put these options in because we are going to rely upon the defaults for each of these. But there's one option in particular that I want to mention because it might be very important for you to use at some point in time in the future. Okay. So I want you to imagine kind of what happens behind the scenes when we hand that persistent volume claim off to Kubernetes. And so if we look back at the diagram over here, remember at some point in time, we hand that pod config off and Kubernetes sees, oh, they want that 500 gigabyte option. And so Kubernetes has to like go and find either that pre-configured, pre-created ahead of time persistent volume or make one on the fly. So think about what's going on behind the scenes there. We're essentially saying to Kubernetes, hey, I need one gigabyte worth of storage. Can you get me something that meets these requirements? That's what the persistent volume claim is really doing. So Kubernetes gets that, and then we're going to imagine what exactly happens on your computer when you run this stuff. We can kind of imagine that Kubernetes probably says something like, all right, well, I'm on this developer's personal laptop, or maybe I'm on their personal desktop, not a lot of storage options available here. Like pretty much all I've got to put any information in is your hard drive. So on your computer, by default, Kubernetes is going to say, you know what, I'm going to make a slice of your hard drive that is one gigabyte large. And so we can imagine on your hard drive, we get this one gigabyte little piece of your hard drive that is going to be a persistent volume. And that persistent volume gets handed back over to your pod. So on your computer, when you ask Kubernetes for some amount of storage, there's really just one place for Kubernetes to allocate that storage. It's just your hard drive, and there's really not a lot of other options. Now you can actually see in the Kubernetes config where it decides to make this the default, where it decides to say, I'm just gonna put it on your hard drive. To do so, you can flip on over to your terminal and run kubectl git storage class. 
So when you run get storage class, you're going to see all the different options on your computer that Kubernetes has for creating a persistent volume. Right now we have a single option called standard. It is the default option. So if we do not specify a storage class with our persistent volume claim, the standard option will be used by default. And the provisioner, or essentially how Kubernetes is going to decide how to provision or create this persistent volume is by using the minikube host path option. I want you to also do a kubectl describe storage class as well. And you'll see some more information about that option right there. So when you do so, it tells you in very broad terms, yes, we have a provisioner that is minikube host path. Minikube host path means exactly what we saw over here. Minikube host path means that when we ask Kubernetes to create this persistent volume, it's going to look on the host machine to Minikube, and it's going to make a little slice of space on your personal hard drive. All right, so at this point, this probably seems you know, at least somewhat palatable. Like, yeah, Kubernetes needs some space. It's going to try to claim some space off of your computer or your personal hard drive. But things start to get way more complicated when we start to move our Kubernetes cluster from your computer into a cloud environment. So at some point in time, you and I are going to move our application over to a cloud provider. And when we are working with a cloud provider, we get a tremendous number of different options of where some hard drive space or essentially file system space can be sourced from. So in a cloud or production environment, if we say, hey, I need one gigabyte of storage to Kubernetes, Kubernetes is going to turn around and say, great, which one do you want? I got like a billion options available. And so just about every cloud provider that you're going to work with is going to have some different solution for storing information. And you need to tell Kubernetes, unless you want to use the default option, which of these different options you want to use. So if you are hosting an application on Google Cloud, the Google Cloud service called Persistent Disk is going to be used to store information with your persistent volume. If you're on Microsoft Azure, you can either use Azure File or Azure Disk. If you're on AWS, you will use AWS Block Store. Now, there's many other options that are available in a cloud environment. You can see some of the other options at this address right here. I actually already opened up that page. So on that page, you'll see storage classes. And if you scroll down to provisioner, the provisioner is essentially what determines how the space you're asking for gets created. And so these are all the different options that you have available. You can look at that list and decide on which one you want. But I can tell you that by default, most of the time, you're probably going to want whatever the default is for your particular cloud provider, which on, say, Google Cloud, it's going to be persistent disk. On AWS, it's going to be block store. Now, when you create your Kubernetes cluster on a cloud provider like Google Cloud or AWS, one of these services is going to be set up by default for you. So in other words, right now, inside of our local environment, we are setting up this persistent volume claim without designating a storage class name. And we did not designate that option because we are relying upon the default. And like I just said, the default for us is to create a little slice on our hard drive to use for this persistent volume. But when you push your application up to Kubernetes on Google Cloud or AWS, the standard option is not going to be Minikube host path. Instead, the standard option or the default option for use on AWS or Google Cloud will be automatically configured for you to be either Google Cloud Persistent Disk or AWS Block Store. So long story short here, what I'm trying to tell you is that when you ask Kubernetes for some amount of storage on your local machine, it's just going to take a slice of your hard drive. When you are in a cloud environment, it's going to choose one of these default options for you unless you very specifically tell it to use something else. For most applications, you know, I, I don't really want to make a broad claim here, but I'm going to tell you that if you've got a normal application that just has a traditional database like Postgres or MySQL, you're probably going to be okay using the default options, which are probably going to usually be Google Cloud Persistent Disk or AWS Block Store. But I just want you to know that this option is available and you can customize where Kubernetes is going to look to create this little file system to allocate to your pod. All right, so enough on all this. I think we've spoken about persistent volume claims enough. So we've now created our persistent volume claim, which is essentially advertising an option that can be used for storage by all the different pods in our application. 
So last thing we have to do in the next section, we're going to open up our Postgres deployment and we're going to update the pod config in here and tell it that when this pod is created, it's going to need to look at all the different storage options that are available and advertised by this persistent volume claim and make sure that it says, oh yeah, I want this very specific volume claim that's going to give me a two gigabyte storage option. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we finished up our persistent volume claim. I'm now going to flip over to my Postgres deployment file. So I'm going to find the template section of this. Remember, this is the template that is used for every pod that is created by this deployment. And there's only ever going to be one pod at a time. We are going to update this template section and tell this pod that when it is created, it needs to request some type of long-term storage, in other words, a persistent volume, that meets all the requirements that were advertised by this persistent volume claim that we just put together. So inside of my Postgres deployment file, I'll find the template section and then the spec inside there. And inside the spec, we're going to add on a new key value pair. So I'm on the same indentation level as containers right here. And I'm going to say volumes. This is going to be an array. So I'll put a dash in and then I'll say name of Postgres storage and then persistent, persistent volume claim, claim name. And this is going to be the name of the claim that we had just put together in the other file. Its name was database persistent volume claim. So the claim name will be database persistent volume claim. Okay, so this right here is what sets up the request on the pod to reach out to Kubernetes and say, I need some type of long-term storage that meets all the requirements that are laid out inside of this database persistent volume claim object. And that's what we had just put together over here. So this line alone is what's going to make Kubernetes realize that it needs to go over to either the local hard drive, if we are in the case of your local environment, or some cloud provider in the case of being deployed in production, and say, hey, I need to somehow source or somehow get some slice of storage that has this access mode and storage of two gigabytes. So all this is going to do right here is allocate that storage. Once we allocate that storage, once we get it available, we need to actually assign it for use by all the different containers that are in use by our pod. So in addition to this volume section right here, we're also gonna add on some config to our container section as well. So inside my container section, I'm gonna add in a new line here, and I'm going to get on the same indentation level as name, image, and ports, and I'll say volume mounts. So this is going to say, hey, all right, we just got access to the storage, and here's how I want it to be used inside of my container. So I'm going to add in a dash here because this is an array. We can have multiple volume mounts on a single container. I'll give it a name of Postgres, uh, Postgres storage. Now this right here is the most important part. Notice how the volume name and the volume mount name are identical. So when you put the name right here, it means go back out to the volumes entry and find some piece of storage that we just asked Kubernetes for. In this case, it's going to find this piece of storage right here, and that piece of storage is going to be used for this particular volume mount. We're then going to put in a mount path. The mount path is designating where inside the container this storage should be made available. So in other words, we're going to put in a little folder reference right here, and then anything that the container stores at that folder or inside that directory will be actually stored inside of our volume. Remember, this is, at the end of the day, pretty darn similar to the Docker volumes that we had used previously. So for the mount path, we're going to designate the data directory that Postgres uses for storing data on the hard drive, because that's the actual data that we want to back up. We want to back up all the data that Postgres is storing on the hard drive. The default storage location for Postgres is var lib postgresql slash data, like so. Okay, now for a normal volume, that would be it. So if this was just a normal application where we're just trying to set up some persistent storage, that's really all we have to do. Both Postgres, Postgres in particular, we're going to put in one additional little option here. So as an additional option, I'm going to also put in subpath is Postgres, like so. The subpath option means that any data inside the container that is stored inside of mount path 
is going to be stored inside of a folder called Postgres inside of the actual persistent volume claim. So if we ran our application for some amount of time and then save some data to our Postgres database, and then it eventually opened up our persistent volume, we would see that all the data that was saved to this folder is nested inside of a folder called Postgres inside the persistent volume. Now, like I said, this is something very specific for Postgres. It's just because if you try to start up Postgres by default with something that it thinks is a volume mount, it's going to say, hey, I don't want to save data here. And so by having Postgres instead save data into a subfolder inside there, it's going to override that default behavior. Now, saving data into a volume with Postgres is totally fine, totally fine. It's just that Postgres, in some cases, thinks that you're not necessarily working with Docker. It gets a, it's a long story. Let's just leave it at that. It, this is just some very particular stuff around Postgres, probably not super interesting to you or what you're going to be working on in your own application. So I'm just going to stop right there. All right, so that's pretty much it. So let's do a very quick review here. We put together the persistent volume claim that tells Kubernetes that we want to find a storage option with these requirements. When we put together our pod template, we said we want to have a volume available that matches these requirements. And then inside the container, we put together some actual options to say, take that volume and make it available inside of this very particular container. So that's the entire story. Let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to try to apply all these updated config files and just make sure that everything is working the way we expect. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we finished up all of our Postgres persistent volume claim stuff. So the last thing we have to do is apply it to our local cluster. I'm going to flip over to my terminal. I'm going to make sure I'm still inside of my complex directory, and then we'll do our kubectl apply dash f. And as usual, we're just going to throw everything inside of the k8s directory into the apply command. So I'm going to run that, and we're going to very quickly see that we have created a new claim and that we have reconfigured the Postgres deployment. So now we're going to get the status of our deployment and all of its pods and just make sure that everything is still working the way we expect. So the first thing I'll do is a kubectl get pods. We're going to see Postgres inside of here, and it looks like it just got restarted and is now running. So that's good. I'll do a kubectl get PV, which stands for persistent volumes. And this is going to list out all the different persistent volumes that have been created inside of our application. And on here, we can see that we have a persistent volume with the name of PVC, blah, 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 blah. It has two gigabytes. This is the access mode. And there's a couple other columns on here. I'll probably have to zoom out really far. OK, on the very far right-hand side, you can see that it has a claim using our database persistent volume claim. And the status of it is bound, which means that it is currently in use. We can now also do a kubectl get PVC. And that will list out all the different claims that we have created as well. So remember, the claim right here is an advertisement. It is saying you can get this thing if you want to. The persistent volume right here is saying here's an actual instance of storage that meets all the requirements that were laid out by the persistent volume claim that we made. OK, so that's pretty much it. So hopefully now, if we write any data to Postgres and then for some reason kill that pod, ideally it will not wipe out any of the data that had been stored inside the database. Now, we're not going to be able to test that yet because we have not yet configured Express or our worker instances to actually save data into Postgres. So that's the last thing that we really need to take care of. Let's take a quick pause right here. And in the next section, we're going to figure out how to add in some environment variables to make sure that our server and the worker can both connect to Postgres and Redis to save some amount of data. So quick pause, and I'll see you in just a minute. One of the last things we have to do to set up our application in Kubernetes is set up some different environment variables. So as a quick reminder, we've got a handful of environment variables that need to be assigned to both the multi-server and the multi-worker. The multi-worker needs to know how to connect to Redis through the environment variables of Redis host and Redis port. The multi-server needs to know the same thing, and the multi-server also needs to have a set of environment variables to tell it how to connect to Postgres as well. So in this section and the next couple, we're going to describe and discuss how we set up environment variables in Kubernetes. All right, now in this diagram, I took the same environment variables and I did a little bit of color coding. So first off, let's talk about the meaning behind the yellow color inside of here. So this, 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 and this, all the yellow ones are going to essentially be consistent, constant values. And we don't have to do a lot of work to set these up inside of our different deployment definitions. All the yellow ones are going to be pretty darn straightforward. 
Now there's two red ones on here as well. So the two host values, these are also going to be constant values that don't, do not need to change over time or anything like that. But I want to remind you about the purpose of the host environment variables. These are essentially URLs of sorts that are going to tell multi-worker and multi-server how to connect to Redis and Postgres in the first place. In other words, how it can actually reach out to the running Postgres server or the running Redis server and make a connection to them. So with that in mind, I want to remind you about the kind of overall architecture of our application. Remember that we've got our Redis pod right here and Postgres pod right here. And we had said that the multi-worker and the multi-server are going to connect to both those different pods through the use of that cluster IP service. So we need to understand how we can tell multi-worker to connect over to this Redis pod somehow through this cluster IP service. And we're going to do this by providing a value to the Redis host environment variable and the PG host environment variable as well. So let me just tell you, let's get down to basics here. It's a real straightforward thing. Essentially, all we have to do is say, okay, we want to form a connection from our deployment of multi-worker over to the Redis pod that is being managed by the cluster IP service. So all we have to do is provide a host name of the name of that cluster IP service. If you open up your code editor and find the cluster client cluster, no, not that one, where is it? Uh, there it is, Redis cluster IP service right here. Remember, we had given it a name of Redis cluster IP service. That's gonna be the host name. So you can kind of imagine that we're going to connect to HTTP colon slash slash Redis cluster IP service. Now there's not going to actually be the HTTP on there. I just put it on there to make you understand that this is kind of like a URL and to connect from one pod over to another, we just provide the name of that cluster IP. All right, so that's not too bad. So in total, all the first set of environment variables, like all these up here, they're going to essentially be constant values. And we just have to go around to our different pod deployment configurations and add in a little bit more config to say, hey, here's an environment variable of like Redis host, and here's the value for it. Same thing for the port, same thing for the user, everything straight down. Now the one value in this entire list here that's going to kind of stick out like a sore thumb that we're going to do a little bit of additional work on is going to be the PG password. So PG password is a password to our Postgres database. And without a doubt, we probably do not want to stick this as a constant value or just in plain text inside of our Kubernetes config files. And so we're going to do a little bit more extra work above and beyond for the PG password. And we're going to learn how to manage secrets or secret variables inside of our Kubernetes cluster. But we're going to first do all the setup for all these other ones, and then we'll tackle the PG password at the very end. So let's take a quick break right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to start setting up our environment variables for the multi-worker and multi-server. In this section, we're going to update our config files for the multi-server and the multi-worker and add all these different environment variables. Again, we're going to leave off the PG password for right now. We're not gonna worry about that one just yet. We're gonna come back to it at the very end. All right, so we're gonna first open up our multi-worker config file, the deployment for it, and we're going to add in a little bit of configuration to that. So inside of my code editor, I'll find the worker deployment file then inside of here, I'm going to scroll down to the pod template. So here's my template section. I'm then going to find the container definition, and we're going to add on a set of environment variables that are going to be passed into this container when it is created inside of the pod. And so on the container definition, I'll add on an env environment, or excuse me, an env key. Env is short for environment variables. We're going to designate a couple here. So env is going to receive an array. So I'm going to put in a dash like so. Then for every entry inside this array, we're going to have a name and a value property. And I bet you can guess what these are going to do. Name is going to be the name of the environment variable and then value is going to be the value for it. So for our first named environment variable that we're going to pass into the worker, we'll pass in our Redis host. And again, this is going to be some type of reference telling all our multi-worker container how it can reach out and connect to Redis. So what we want to put in here is the name of the cluster IP service that the worker needs to connect to to get at the Redis pod. And again, in this case, it's going to be Redis cluster IP service because that's what we provided as the name for that cluster. When we put it together, 
or that cluster IP when we put it together inside of our Redis cluster IP service file. So this is the string right here. That's what we care about. So for the value I will put in Redis cluster IP service. And then next up, we're going to also designate the Redis port. The port value here is going to be 6379. That is the default value for the Redis connection port. It's also what we wired up inside of our Redis cluster IP service as both the opening port and the target port in there as well. So this again is going to be a hard coded value. We're just going to throw it directly in here as 6379, like so. Okay, so that's it for the worker deployment. It's all the environment configuration we need. So I'm going to close that file. And then we're going to also open up our, where is it? The server deployment right there as well. So in the server deployment, we're going to add in a set of environment variables to the server. So I'm going to find the server container configuration. And inside of here, we're going to do our env block as well. Now this one's going to have significantly greater number of environment variables. So we're going to do a little bit of typing here. Let's see. We'll start off first with a name of Redis host. The value again is going to be the name of our Redis cluster IP service, which was Redis cluster IP service. We'll do another array entry. So notice how I put another dash right here. This is going to be our Redis port. We'll have a value of 6379 over here as well. Next up, we'll do our PG user. So this is going to be the default username for Postgres. And we just use the default of Postgres, which is technically not good form, not the best way to make use of Postgres here, but totally fine for our purposes. Next up, we'll do our PG host. So the PG host is the connection string. We're essentially telling multi-server how to reach out to our Postgres instance. And so very similar to what we just did with Redis, we're going to do the same thing with Postgres as well. We're going to provide the name of the cluster IP service that is managing access to the Postgres pod. So I'm going to open up the Postgres cluster IP service config file right here. I'll find the name. And that's going to be the host name that we want to attempt to connect to to get access to that database. So for my PG host, I'm going to put in Postgres cluster IP service like so. All right, so what do we have next? I think we have our PG port. The value for that, we are using the default of 5432. No changes there. Remember, we also set up our Postgres cluster IP service to make that port available. And I think probably the last one, actually, you know, I think we got two more here. What do we have? I just want to double check the diagram and make sure I'm not missing any in here. So we got the port, I think it's the database, right? Yeah. All right. So we're going to do our PG database. And again, we are using the default Postgres database of Postgres. Again, very much like the PG user using the default database, not quite the best way of doing things, but for our purposes, it is good enough. All right, so I think that's it in terms of the initial set of environment variables. So let's take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're going to talk a little bit more about the PG password, and we're going to make sure that when we put this into a config file, we are not writing out the password in plain text. We're going to make sure that we store it in a much more secure fashion. So quick pause, and we'll take care of that in the next video. There's one last environment variable that we have to set up, the PG password. This environment variable is a password that's going to be used to get access to our database. Now, one thing I want to be really clear about right now is that the password is tied to Postgres itself. This is not a password related to Docker or Kubernetes or anything like that. We are talking about just getting access to Postgres. We need to make sure that we add in this environment variable and pass it to the multi-server. But like I said in the last video, chances are that we do not want to write out our password in plain text and store it inside of our config file. So rather than adding in pass our password as plain text or anything like that, we're going to use a new type of object inside of Kubernetes that we have not yet discussed. So the new type of object we're going to use is something called a secret. So it's a very similar type of object in the sense that we had previously created a pod, a deployment, a service, and so on. The purpose of a secret 
is to securely store one or more pieces of information inside of your cluster. So a good example of a use of a secret be for a database password, an API key, or maybe an SSH key, or any similar type of secret piece of information that you do not want to have easily exposed to the outside world, but you do want to make available to running containers inside of your application. And so our database password perfectly qualifies as something that we would want to store inside a secret. Now the secret is only about information that you want to very much protect. So in our example, of our environment variables here, storing the Redis host right here would have not been a very good use of a secret because the Redis host is always going to be the name of our service. And the name of our service is very plainly legible and readable inside of our Redis cluster IP file right here. So not a good reason to try to store the Redis host, for example, inside of a secret, probably the same for the thing for the port, now maybe the PG user would be something to store inside of a secret. Maybe the PG database would be as well. But for our example here, we're just gonna worry about encoding our PG password and storing it inside of a secret. All right, so how do we create a secret? Well, a secret is an object, very much like a pod, a deployment, a service. And so we have said a billion times throughout this course that we always create an object through the use of a config file. However, you and I are not going to use a config file to create a secret. Instead, we are going to run a imperative command that's going to create the secret for us. So why are we using an imperative command here as opposed to a config file? Well, when you create the secret, you have to provide the data that you want to encode. And so if we had to write out a config file that said, hey, here's our secret, like in plain text, here's the PG password, then it would kind of defeat the purpose of having a secret anyways. So we're going to create our secret with a single command. It's gonna be imperative in nature. And that means that we're going to have to run this command locally on our computer to create the secret. It also means that when we eventually take our application to a production environment, we're going to have to make sure that we create the secret manually in the production environment as well. Everything else that we've done with the config file, such as our deployments and our services, do not need to be manually created in a production environment. All we have to do is apply the config files that represent each of them. So again, our secret being imperative in nature, we're going to have to make sure that we manually create this thing in any environment that we eventually take our application to. So to create the secret, we're going to run a rather long kubectl command. I'm gonna zoom in on this thing and then we'll go over it step by step. So we're going to use kubectl create. Create is a imperative command that we can use to create a new object without necessarily using a config file. You will see a lot of documentation and a lot, a lot of blog posts out there talking about kubectl create. Remember, we have not been using this command throughout this course because we've been taking the more imperative, or excuse me, more declarative approach of using those config files. We're then going to designate the type of object that we want to create. So of course, we want to make a secret. And then we will designate the type of secret. Now, our type of secret is generic, which indicates that we are saving some arbitrary number of key value pairs together. There are two other types of secrets that you might create. The first one is a Docker registry. So you would put in Docker registry. The other type of secret you can make is TLS. And TLS is related to say HTTPS setup. And we would use the TLS right here to store a set of TLS keys. Now the vast majority of the time you are going to use the generic, we would use the Docker registry one anytime that we want to set up some type of authentication with a custom Docker registry that would we would be storing our images in. Now you and I are storing all of our images in Docker Hub, so no custom authentication is required. So we do not need to make a secret of type Docker registry. And then as far as that TLS secret, we actually might be setting up some HTTPS stuff later. So we might end up using that other type of secret at some point in time, but we'll see. Okay, so after generic, we'll then put down a name for the secret. The secret name is very important. It's very similar to the name property. So we've added to all of our other objects. The name property is going to be how we refer back to the secret at some point in time in the future when we actually want to consume it and make use of this secret inside of a pod config. Then the last two arguments on here are going to be from literal. So when we use dash dash from literal, that means that we're going to write out the information to be stored inside the secret in this actual command. 
as opposed to trying to write the secret information into a file and then load up all that secret data from the file. So because we are using from literal, we're going to add on our information as a key value pair at the very end of the command. You and I want to encode some environment variable called pg password. So we'll probably end up doing something like pg password equals and then our actual password, whatever it might be. You know, for us, we'll probably keep it something simple like password123 or whatever it might be. Okay, so that's the entire command. So let's flip over to our terminal. We're going to write this thing out. And again, I want to remind you that we're going to have to run this command locally in our machine. And when we eventually move off to production, we're going to have to run the same command again to create a secret on that new environment as well. So let's get to it. I'm going to flip back over to my terminal. I'm going to run cube CTL create secret. We're going to make a type of secret called generic. The secret name will be PG password. Notice how we're doing this in lowercase here. So this is not the actual environment variable. It's not the actual secret. It's just the name of the secret. So we're going to eventually have to reference this thing in the future and say, hey, go pull some information out of the secret called PG password. We'll then do dash dash from literal. I'll zoom in here, just to make sure it's nice and legible. There we go. So dash dash from literal. And then we're going to put down the actual key value pair that we want to encode. So I'll do PG password equals, I don't know, one, two, three, four, five ASDF, whatever you want it to be. It's totally up to you. All right, so that's the entire command. So I'm now going to run this and we'll see that the secret was created. And now just to verify that, yep, it was successfully created and to look at the secret, we'll put in kubectl get secrets like so and it's going to tell us all right we've got a secret called pg password and there's one key value pair inside there and the key value pair is the pg password that we put in right here all right so that's it we've now created a secret that is going to store our postgres database password so now the last thing that we have to do is wire up the secret to our server deployment so we need to make sure that our server container knows about the secret and receives it as an environment variable. And then the other thing that we have to do that might be a little bit less obvious is that we have now created a database password that is something different than the default Postgres password, which is by default something like, I don't know, PG password or whatever it is. I forget it off the top of my head. So we need to make sure that we also update our Postgres deployment as well we're going to update our Postgres container definition and tell it about the password that it should be using as its default check. So we want to override the image's default password that it sets up when it creates a copy of database inside that container and say, hey, use this password instead. And so anytime that someone tries to connect to the database, it's going to try to authenticate that connection with the, post with the password that we provide to it. So two places to wire up the secret. Let's take a pause right now and we'll take care of both these things in the next section. In this section, we're going to wire up our Postgres secret that we just created in the last section to our server deployment and our Postgres deployment as well. So we're gonna first start inside of our server deployment.yaml file. I'm gonna scroll down to my list of environment variables because we want to provide this password as an environment variable. So at the very end of this list, I'm going to add on a new name. The name is going to be PG password. Now, something to make clear here is that this is the name of the environment variable. So this is how our secret or our encoded password is going to show up inside the container. The name of PG password right here is not at all related to the secret. And in fact, it could be something totally different. It could be my password or whatever we want it to be. But in our case, our copy of the multi-server image is going to be looking for a PG password environment variable. And so that's why we are going to use specifically PG password as the name. Then rather than specifying a value property, we're going to provide a value from property. So we're essentially saying, get the value for this environment variable from some configuration that we're going to put in here. And so we're going to put in a secret key ref, and then we'll provide a name the name is going to be the name of the secret that we want this environment variable value to come from. 
So the name of our secret that we just put together was PG password, all lowercase right there. So as my name, I'll put in PG password. And then we also have to put in a key. Remember that a secret can store many key value pairs. We only put one key value pair in here, but we could have very easily added in several other key value pairs as well. And so we need to point out the key value pair that we want to shove into this environment variable. So the key that we want to reference is PG password. So for the key, I'll put in PG password, like so. So now that we put the name and the key right here, Kubernetes is going to automatically open up the secret with the name of PG password. It's going to find the key value pair inside of there equal to key. So that's this one right here. It's going to find the value associated with it, which is one, two, three, four, five ASDF. And it's going to pass that into our container as the environment variable called PG password. Now, one thing that's a little bit unclear here, or I feel like might be a little bit confusing is the fact that our name of the environment variable and the key inside the secret are identical. So again, we could have very easily changed, say the key right here to be like my password without any issue whatsoever. We would have just needed to make sure that the key that we provided right here, rather than PG password, it would have had to have been my password as well. All right, so I'm gonna change that back like so. Okay, so that's how we wire up a secret as an environment variable. So our server, now knows about the password to use for the database. So now the last thing we have to do is to make sure that our Postgres database knows about the password that it should be using. So we're essentially going to override its default password. All right, so for this, we're gonna find our Postgres deployment file. We're gonna scroll on down to our container definition right here, and we're going to add on a ENV property to our container definition like so. Now, please triple check, make sure that ENV is on the same indentation level as the name, image, ports, and volume mounts properties. If you want to be real safe, you could actually just add it up right here and not have to worry about matching the indentation at all. Just a quick reminder, all these key value pairs inside of a YAML file do not need to be ordered in any specific fashion. Okay, so for env right here, I'm going to pass in a name of PG password. So now we are setting up a environment variable of PG password that we're going to pass into the container. If the container or the image Postgres right here sees an environment variable of PG password, it's going to use that as the default password as opposed to the, or excuse me, as the password as opposed to the default password of whatever it usually is. And again, I forget what it is off the top of my head. Okay, so we're going to create the PG password environment variable. And then we're going to say you're going to get the value for this from a secret key reference. And again, it's going to have a name of PG password. And the key that we want to reference inside of that password or that secret is PG password right there. So we will provide a key of PG password like so. All right, so that's pretty much it. So we have now set up a custom password for our database. We have told our copy of Postgres to make use of that password anytime someone tries to connect. And we've also told our server pod, or more specifically, the multi-server container that gets created, what that secret password is. So that's pretty much it. Now, the very last thing that we are going to need to do is to apply the changes that we just made to these configuration files. So I'm sure you recall how to do that. We'll flip on over to our terminal, and we'll do a kubectl apply dash f k8, like so. Now, it looks like I've got a little bit of an error message here. You'll notice that it says cannot convert int64 into string. I know exactly where that's coming from. This was a expected error, don't worry about it. So we'll take a quick pause right here. When we come back to the next section, we're gonna fix this thing up very quickly. So quick pause and I'll see you in just a minute. In the last section, we tried to apply our updated configuration files, but we very quickly got an error message that said something like cannot convert int64 into string. So this is an error message that I personally just wanted you to see because I can almost guarantee you'll see this when you start putting together your own application. We're seeing this message right here because inside of our server deployment file and our worker as well, we provided some environment variables as integers. So right here, our Redis port, 
has a integer value or essentially a number as 6379 and the PG port is 5432, also a number. Whenever we provide a environment variable, we have to provide it as a string. So for the value of 6379, all we have to do is wrap this with a quote like so, and the same thing on the PG port as well. That's all we have to do. Then inside of our worker deployment, we'll find the Redis port of 6379. Again, we cannot have an environment variable in here as a number. We have to provide it as a string. And so the simple workaround is to just wrap this thing with a set of quotes like so. All right, now that we've made those changes, I'm gonna save both those files. And then we'll flip back over to our terminal and try to apply these config files again. So I'll do a kubectl apply dash f k eights. Now I'm going to tell you if we get any errors this time, I was not planning on it. So if we see an error message, we're going to have to go back and figure out what's going on and try to fix it. All right, so I'm going to run that and it looks like everything worked out just fine. You'll notice that the server deployment has been configured. It looks like our worker deployment has also been configured. Now I'm looking for Postgres in here. Where's our Postgres deployment? It looks like the Postgres deployment is unchanged, which is not quite expected. However, you know what probably happened is it probably applied the config during our last apply in the last section. So I think it's totally fine to see that the Postgres deployment is unchanged there. Unfortunately, I've already cleared my console log, so I can't scroll up and verify that Postgres did get configured successfully. Nonetheless, we'll be able to test this out soon enough inside of our browser and be able to verify that everything worked correctly. So let's take a quick pause right here and we'll continue in the next section. There's just one last little piece of configuration that we have to do to set up our application.